Today we are talking about uniform circular motion. So as an object is spinning in a circle, um, we are going to concentrate just when it gets up to full speed. So we're not talking about when it's starting its spin or when it's ending its spin. We'll just talk about as it's going and spinning, basically at a constant circular um, motion. So as we have something going in a circle, it would basically, uh, basically be something like this. And if we looked at a vector, say one point, we'd pick one point right here. And we could say the velocity at this particular moment is v initial. And then we could look at another moment, and we could say the velocity just, just a moment later might be, say, right around here. It would be going like this. And that would be v final. See, whenever we talk about a velocity, if you were in a car and this was a rotary, rotary and you're driving around the rotary, your speed would be tangent to the circle. So tangent is just one straight line that's touching the circle at one point. So this is basically a tangent line that's touching the circle at this point. So when we talk about the speed of something, if this circle here was, um, if this um, object was spinning in a clockwise direction, then we would say that this has a speed here of a certain number, and then over here we would have a speed of a certain number. Now, they would both be the same number, but as far as velocity goes, a velocity is a vector that had both magnitude and direction. So, as you can see, this one is pointing due east, and this one's pointing a little bit southeast. So, they're not the exact same vector. You, might, you may have your car on cruise control, and you may go around a rotary at a constant speed, but it doesn't mean at every second you have the exact same velocity vector because you're changing directions. So one of the things we could do is um, when we talk about acceleration, we could say that acceleration, it's defined as the change in the velocity over the change in time. So we could say that the acceleration is equal to v final minus v initial over the time. And then we could say, um, we could do this graphically. So you see, if I, if I want to subtract vectors, uh, I take the, um, I could basically do this. I could basically say velocity final plus a negative velocity initial over the time. And that's another acceleration thing I could look at. So I can draw the final velocity first and then draw the negative of the initial velocity. So I'll just change the arrowhead and then, um, see what happens if I go from um, tip to tail and see what happens to the overall beginning and the overall ending. So maybe right over here I could say, if I draw the final velocity first, it's going kind of like this. I may have drawn that at a little bit of too much of an angle. So that's V final. And if I, if I try to add a negative of this, I just have to change the arrowhead so it's pointing to the left. So then I could do something like this. Okay, so this was our overall start, and this was our overall end. So this is a negative v initial. And what happens in this case is we're looking for the change in the velocity, and this would be the, the resultant vector. That would be the net. Um, that would be the difference between those two. And as you can see, if I, if I drew it right here, if I said this one goes first, and then I try to do something like this, then you can see the difference would be pointing this way. Okay? And that's delta v. Now, delta v is a vector. And a vector has a direction. And the acceleration is a vector. The acceleration is a vector based on delta v, which is a vector. So they, they both will point in the same direction. So what I'm trying to show you here is that as we go around in a circular pattern, the change in the velocity from small moments of time to small moments of time later, um, it's pointing basically towards the center. So this would be the center of the circle. And you can see how it's kind of pointing right towards the center there. So when we talk about circular motion, there will be an acceleration because we will be talking about a change in the velocity vector, and the acceleration is going to be called centripetal. Okay, so in this particular chapter, we talk about a certain um, acceleration. So let me um, clear so the board. So if we had an object 
that would be traveling in a circular fashion like this. So the motion is going to be along this circle. Then it would have something called a centripetal. Now the word centripetal means center seeking. So when they say we have a centripetal acceleration, it is um, an object that would, would be accelerating towards the center. If they say we have a centripetal force, it would be a force that's pushing towards the center. Um, and many, many people think that the exact opposite happens. If you, if you could imagine for a moment that you would be in a car and you'd be going around a rotary. Um, I believe you'd be driving in America the other, the other way, but let's say you're in a, in a car driving along this way. Um, it doesn't really make sense um, in my fashion. It should be going the other way. But um, imagine the person who's sitting near the door and they feel like they're being thrown out and away from the center of the circle. What's happening is that person actually wants to be going in a straight line. In chapter four, we studied um, uh, inertia. And we said um, inertia is the tendency of any object to continue doing what it's doing. So inertia, if you're, if you're driving in a car, and you have a velocity that's trying to make you go in this direction, well then you see your body would like to continue going in that direction. But if you're on a, an amusement park ride or some type of thing that's turning this way, then as you're turning this way, um, your body wants to go in a straight line. And what happens is the door basically comes up and pushes you. You get the feel that you're pushing against the door, but what really happens is you're trying to, your body's trying to go in a straight line, and the door is preventing it, so the door is pushing you in, making sure that you keep, maintain circular motion. Um, if the door wasn't latched correctly, you would go out and you would not maintain circular motion. So the word centripetal is what we use in physics, and it means center seeking. Um, there's another word called centrifugal, which is a fictitious fictional force. Um, a fictitious force, not frictional. It's just a fictitious force. So there's no, there's no real force called um, centrifugal force. But what it is, is with Newton's third law, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if you feel something trying to pull, um, you know, if you're pulling in on something, that object will try to resist and be pulling away from you, for, for example. So for example here, I have um, this, this uh, child holding on to some type of a tube, and they're spinning something around. Now, it could be almost anything. It could be a rubber stopper. It could be one of those. When I was a kid, we had these airplanes that were on a little wire, and you pushed a button. They didn't fly well, but you could actually make them spin around by doing something like this. Um, the person is holding on to this stick and spinning the thing around and around, and that's a string right there. The only force um, really acting on this thing would be the tension in the string. And the tension in the string, strings can only pull one way. So strings can only pull inward. So this would be the tension. And as you can see, the tension in the string is pointing in towards the center of the circle. There's, there's nothing out here trying to pull this stopper, rubber stopper, out this way. But yet people will say that they feel like it's being pulled out. So this particular um, object is moving in a circle. We say it's moving at a constant speed in the circle. And because of Newton's third law, this is the real force pulling on it. But the person over here would be feeling an equal and opposite force. So right at the edge of this straw here, the person would be feeling an equal and opposite force there. And a force that points away from the center of the circle would be called centrifugal. But that's a fictitious force. It doesn't really exist. We j it's just the effect of the centripetal. So we will concentrate on this one, okay? Which which is called um, uh, acceleration centripetal. But in our book, they they use a slightly um, different notation. The majority of books use the word centripetal. They use a subscript C. This book uses radial, and radial basically means along the radius. So 
in this book, what you'll see is you will see um, a subscript with a capital letter R. So they write it in the book this way: the acceleration radial. Okay, these are these things are all vectors. So when you when you see that, um, it's it's kind of a nice way to do it because this object here has a, an acceleration pointing along the line of the radius. So it's kind of nice to call it the radial line. So if you think of the force radial, and you can remember radial means along the radius, then that's that's how it goes here. Most most people may forget if centripetal means towards the center or away from the center. So this one here along the radial, pointing towards the radius, should make more sense. So when we um if we to draw if we were to draw a circle and we were to talk about starting here and we go around one complete revolution and we end here okay well uh what we just did is we traveled along a distance called the circumference So the circumference is a formula called 2 pi r, and r would be here for the radius. But the other thing is, in physics, there's something called a small letter t, which is any time. So when you see a small letter t, we're talking about any time. But when you see a capital letter t, as far as time goes, it's talking about a particular time. It's called the time period. It has units of seconds, like time does. But this is a very specific type of time. This one here is called the time It's the time for one complete revolution to occur. So in in your life, just think about it. There are many things in your life that make one complete revolution, and they have very, spe uh, very specific, very special names. So, for instance, if there's a an old-fashioned clock um, near you, if you look at it, you'll see three different hands. Each one of those hands is called something. We have the second hand, which clicks off the seconds, and in one minute, the second hand will do one complete revolution. We have the um, we have the minute hand. The minute hand actually will click off the minutes, and so let me start it again. If you look at a clock face, um, the old-fashioned type, you'll see that it has three hands on it. There's that second hand, which you see moving around, and it's clicking off the seconds. So as that's clicking off the seconds, it takes one complete um, minute. It takes one minute to do a complete revolution. Um, if you look at the other hand, the minute hand, um, it takes one complete hour to go through one revolution. If you looked at the hour hand, if it's a regular 12-hour clock, then it would take uh, 12 hours to go through one complete um, revolution for the hour hand. You know, military clocks may have um, 24 digits, I don't know. Uh, if, you, if you think about astronomy, it takes one year for the Earth to travel around the sun, a complete path around the sun. We call that a year. Um, when the Earth makes one complete revolution on its axis, um, we call that one day. Uh, when the moon makes one complete revolution around us, we call that approximately one month. So there's many different things that we would talk about in terms of a complete revolution. So in, in physics, we give it this capital letter T. A small letter T could mean any time whatsoever. But a capital letter T is going to tell us how much time it took to do one complete revolution. So the formula that we end up getting here uh, would be this. As we're going around one complete time, we would say that the velocity would equal, well, velocity, remember, remember distance, um, speed used to equal um, distance over time. Well, in this case, we're talking about the velocity along a um, So 
we're talking about um, v speed or velocity is basically a distance over time. So the distance when we go around a complete circle, around a complete revolution, would be 2 pi r. And we're going to divide that by the time it takes to do one complete revolution. It's called the time period. So we would divide that by the time period. And that's what we get. And this is how we get a formula for the speed of an object going through uniform circular motion. So this would be the speed So we have the um, speed there for uniform circular motion. So before I get too far um, ahead, let me just touch back on this idea of um, time period again. So capital letter T is a time period. We just say the word period. And it's the time for one complete revolution. Well, sometimes we're looking at things and they're spinning so fast that possibly we can't see. Um, or we could never, we could never take a stopwatch and we could never start and stop the stopwatch with one complete revolution. If you think a moment ago I said this kid had a little thing in their hand and they were spinning it around their head, so it was whoosh, 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 spinning really fast, you wouldn't be able to start and stop a stopwatch and get an accurate time period. So what sometimes we could do is, the time period we could do is we could count up a number of those revolutions. We could try to count up to ten of those revolutions or we could try to count any number of those revolutions. And if we knew the total time that it took to do a certain amount of revolutions, we could say the time period would be the number of seconds divided by the number of revolutions. So that would be almost a formula. And with that formula, we could figure out how to get the time period for one revolution really easily. Um, there's something that's the opposite of a time period. It's, ha it's called a frequency. It's, a, it's an F, almost a script F. It's called frequency. It basically talks about how frequently something is going to occur. Like, how many revolutions will that thing spinning around my head, how many revolutions will it do each second? So uh, frequency would be the number of revolutions over the number of seconds. Okay. And frequency has units of hertz, which we write as capital H, small letter Z. It's a person's last name. His name was Heinrich Hertz. And what this means, it's a derived unit, and one hertz is equal to um, it's equal to the unit of um, one and the unit would be one over seconds. So it really it really just means something, a number, a counting number over the number of seconds. Okay. <clears throat> this um, this is something that uh, people kind of know about a little bit. If you're thinking about um, something that's spinning, you could be looking at RPMs on a lot of type of, um, well, on your dashboard for the car, you might see the RPMs. Maybe on some motors, they'll talk about the RPMs. RPMs is telling you how many revolutions it's doing per minute. So R would be for revolutions, P would be for per, meaning over, and M would be for minute. Um, which, which in physics, we have a standard unit of seconds, and it's not minutes. So we would talk about revolutions per second, and that's what this is. And when you hear about that, that's telling us the frequency, okay? So if I had, a, um, if I had something that was spinning, and someone told me that was um, 200 RPMs, what would be happening is, so 200 RPMs would indicate 200 revolutions per minute. So, it, it, but in this case, I wouldn't be able to do that. I would have to say 200 revolutions per, and in one minute, there's 60 seconds. So I would have to convert it. I'd have to say 200 
revolutions divided by 60 seconds, and when I take out my calculator, it'll give me something in RPS, revolutions per second. But what, that, that basically tells us the frequency. So how often is something occurring every single second? Um, you've, you've seen these um, hertz. Uh, electricity works in America on a 60 hertz cycle. So that means the cycle is basically completely changing 60 times in one second. Um, your computers nowadays, they, they, used to, um, they used to have these um, processors that would do a thousand calculations per second, and we would call it kilohertz. And then they had these processors which would do a million calculations per second, and that was called megahertz. And now they're up to um, gigahertz. So giga, giga is a billion. So the computers in gigahertz basically will do um, one billion calculations per second. I don't know how far. I don't think we've gotten much beyond that number. Okay, so that's enough for now. So a little while ago, I was explaining how there is this thing called centripetal acceleration, because if you drive in a car around a rotary, or if you're in an amusement park ride where you're spinning on the outer edge of a circle, you will feel this force. You usually feel the reaction to the force which is pushing you in. So the force pushing you in is called the centripetal force, and what I said is, there's always centripetal acceleration if you're going along in a circle. So what, what happened is, A radial, equals v squared over r, and r is the radius, and f sub radial equals m a sub radial, but using this piece right here, we could say they equal each other, so I could say f sub r equals m b squared over r. So this, this is the um, formulas that would be needed as something is moving in a circular motion. And remember what I had said earlier, that the velocity, we're really talking about a speed here because we're not talking about a velocity vector. It's like the average velocity of all these things. We call it a constant velocity. But remember, we said the speed was basically a distance over time. So the other formula we said is a speed is a distance, 2 pi r. Um, that's the circumference along the edge of a circle if it does one complete revolution. and the time it takes to do one complete revolution is capital T, called the time period. Okay, so this was a formula I gave you earlier in the talk. This is now a new formula, and this is also a new formula. And I usually, depending on what they ask for, um, or what you're given, I usually just use this one. I like this form better. And they gave you everything. You see, A sub R is V squared over R. Okay. The other formula, just, just as a quick reminder, the other formula would have been this. T equals the number of seconds involved over the number of revolutions. And at the same time, F is the number of revolutions over the number of seconds. So those are all the different formulas we're using when we're doing uniform circular motion. And they ask us about the centripetal force or the centripetal acceleration. Or they ask us for what is the average speed of the object moving in the circular path. Okay. So for this particular experiment, what I'm doing is I'm trying to swing a rubber stopper, which is on a string, and I'm trying to swing the rubber stopper in a horizontal circle. And right in front of me, I have this mass, it's 500 grams, and I'm trying to keep that suspended. So the tension in the string holding the 500 grams should be the same tension in the string which is holding the rubber stopper there which would be going in a circle. So the tension in the string should be the centripetal force. So the centripetal force should actually be the exact same as the weight of this 500 gram mass. And I have to stop this.
that is a very common type of a um, demonstration, and it's a very common type of a problem where they would show uh, a person swinging a mass in a horizontal circle, and they would ask you some questions about possibly what is the tension in the string, or possibly what is the frequency of the swing, or possibly what is the speed of the mass moving, or possibly what is the time period of um, one complete revolution. So let me just write that problem behind. So before me, what you see is a, um, a picture. And what I did is I just tried to draw a picture of exactly what I just did. So I had a mass that was on a string. And this would be the mass. In my case, it was a rubber stopper. And there was a certain length to the string. In this case, it was this. The radius here would be the length of the string. Um, and, and what I did, what I did is I tried to say in my problem that this mass here, the hanging mass, was suspended and it wasn't moving. So since this wasn't moving, the tension in the string pulling it up has to be equal and opposite to the weight pulling it down. And if that's the case, then there's only one tension in a string. So if we know what the tension is in the entire string, the weight of this thing would be the same tension in every spot on the string. So the rope there is pulling it inward. And the tension would be the force radial which is also called the force centripetal. So, but that was um, that was what I physically just did. So, what if this person is doing that, and they're just holding like a stick that has a string on the edge of it? So, my word problem here says we have a 200 gram mass. It's on a 12 meter long string, and it's whirled in a horizontal circle at 180 revolutions per minute. Find the time period, comma, find the frequency, comma, and find the tension so in the they, strength. Now you can me, actually see the whole thing. So it says um, a 200 mass, 200 gram, wrong units, mass is on a 1.2 meter long string, and it's whirled in a horizontal circle at 180 revolutions per minute. It says here, find the time period, find the frequency, find the tension in the string. Okay, so that's, that's, that's what our job is right now. So back to our problem um, with the child whirling a mass on the edge of a string. So what we were given, we were given the length of the string is 1.2 meters. That's going to be the radius. So this equals r for radius. Okay. So you see, if you tied a, um, an object to the end of a string and then you hold on to it, well, if you took the string and you hold on to it, the piece would hang down here, and this would be the object right here. So you'd be holding on to this string right here, and it would be dangling. So if you take that and you try to get it spinning in a circle, then it would be spinning in a circle this way. And it would be spinning around in some type of circular fashion. And you notice it's the length of the string now, which would become the radius of the circle. So some people think you have to divide this by two or something. It's the length of the string is the radius. They also told you that this here, it's 180 RPMs. So many people know about RPMs. It means revolutions per minute. Um, if you look at a lot of um, engines and things like that, it'll be written somewhere on the engine what's the maximum RPM. RPM. Um, if you're looking at your dashboard, you probably see something with RPMs, and it's telling you about your engine and how it's spinning. So. What I'm seeing from this is, it says it does 180 revolutions in a time frame of one minute. So I could say, from this, we have 180 revolutions in a time of one minute. Okay. Now, they didn't, they didn't say the time period was one minute. They said we do 180 complete revolutions in a time period of one minute. And we also have this thing, which is a mass. 200 grams, but it's not in the standard units. So the standard unit for mass would be kilograms, so we have to divide it by um, 1,000. So when we divide that, it will become out to be the mass will equal 0.2 kilograms. So we have a lot of things here now. We have the radius, we have the mass, we have um, this, 180 revolutions are occurring in a time of one minute. So if I look at one of the formulas I had, I can find right away, I had asked you to find the period first. So the period, is defined as the number of seconds involved over the number of revolutions. So when we plug that in, it's 60 seconds. OK? 
okay? Because in a time frame of one minute, we have 60 seconds, divided by 180 revolutions. And that's going to come out to be on your calculator 0 0.333 seconds. It continues. Um, the time period means how much time for one complete revolution. So I don't have to look at these units here and say revolution per, sorry, seconds per revolution. I don't have to write per revolution because by definition, capital T is asking me how long does it take for one? And that's what I'm doing. I'm doing one revolution and it takes me this much time. Um, what would be the frequency? The second thing I had asked for was the frequency. So the frequency is just the reciprocal of this. If you just take this and flip it upside down, the frequency is the number of revolutions over the number of seconds. So it's going to be 180 revolutions per So it's going to be 180 revolutions over 60 seconds. And if I do that, I get 3. And what I get is 1 over seconds. That would be the unit. 3 is the number, and 1 per second is the unit. Well, that's also written this way. 3 hertz. So there's my second answer. The second question was, what is the frequency of this? And we just found out the frequency would be 3 hertz. The next question said, what is the tension in the string? So they're asking us to find the tension in the string. Well, that tension there is the force radial. And it has a formula, mv squared over r. So before I can plug it in, I have to know what v is. So v for circular motion has a formula, 2 times pi times r over t. And I know both of those things. I was given the length of the string, which turns out to be the radius, and I just calculated what capital T is. So this is 2 pi times 1.2 divided by 0.333 seconds. And it will come out to be 22.6 meters per second. Okay. So we have this, and now with this piece, I can just go and plug this in. So what I'm really looking for is the force radial equals the mass, 0.2 kilograms, times V squared, 22.6 meters per second. I have to square that, and I'll divide it by the radius. So the radius is 1.2 meters. So you take out your calculator, and you calculate... And it comes out to be 85.3. And it's a Newton. So this is the tension. That's the tension in the string is 85.3 Newtons. So now that we know the answer, I challenge you to um, rearrange that problem in your head. What if they had told you, what if they said something like this? You have a... 200 gram mass so let me challenge you we know the answer for what the um, tension is in the string but now that you know the answer you could take that exact same problem and pretend they gave you the tension at the beginning and they want you to find something else. So we could leave off how many revolutions occurred. So if I rearrange it here as I have, this is not the exact same question, but it's, it's basically the question rearranged. I'm saying here, we take a 200, kilo, a 200 gram mass and we twirl it in a horizontal circle with a 1.2 meter long rope with a tension of 85.3 newtons in the rope. Question, how many revolutions will occur in a one minute time interval. So we know the answer. So if you take this particular piece of the problem and you rearrange it, what you'll get is you'll, you'll start now with the centripetal force or the, the radial force and you'll go backwards in all the formulas until you come up with the number of revolutions that occurred in 60 minutes. So try that. You do know what the answer was because that was what a given in this problem. So back it up and see if you can get the same thing. Okay.